All right, we'll now have our lighting of the Advent wreath. Today is the third Sunday of Advent, joy experienced and shared. From the Psalms and First Thessalonians, our mouth was filled with laughter, and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we rejoiced. Be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. We light the third candle, the candle of joy. When was the last time you found it difficult to contain your joy? What did it feel like to be so joyful? When is the last time you felt in encouraging others, or helping the weak, or being patient with everyone? Take every opportunity to spread joy to others this season. There are many, many opportunities in your community, your nation, and around the world. Let us pray. God of laughter, expand our joy and help us to share it with others this week. Let them see the joy that comes with the expectation we all share during Advent, the birth of our blessed Savior. Amen. Please join in singing the last verse of Pass It On, substituting the word joy for the word love. Our scripture readings this morning come from John chapter 1 and from Isaiah chapter 61. From John 1, chapter 6 to 8, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. And from Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 4. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall rise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. This is the word of God for the people of God. So welcome to the third week in Advent. Praise be to the Lord that we are here with one another. In the last two weeks, we've discussed how this world is a mess. And that we are going to be part of his cleanup crew to clean up this world. And so this week we take on a new job as the decoration committee. Now, how silly it must seem that we would even consider 
the idea of decorating to be important. How could we be worried about something that seems so trivial in a time in this world when so many people are struggling? How could we ever consider the idea of decorating to be as important as pointing out the problems in the world, this place is a mess, and trying to be a part of the group that, take, that works towards solving them, being part of that cleanup crew? How does this even compare to those things? Well, we're going to find out. And now I have to tell you all something, and it may come as a shock to all of you. I have no ability to decorate. I cannot come into a room and look around and think, hmm, you know what? That couch needs six pillows on it. And I can't look at a place and think, you know, the drapes should really be this color in order to accentuate the furniture properly. Most of the clothing that I own is a color that is easily matched with blue jeans, although for the last two weeks, I think everything I own is either camouflage or orange. And I am what you call a classic function over form sort of person. You see, I've never really cared about how something looks. I'm always more concerned about how it operates. I can honestly tell you that I've never once picked a car based on its color. And if you remember my beloved truck that I had, um, I can tell you that I always hated the color of it, but I love that truck more than any other <laughs> car I've ever had. Um, but I didn't pick it because of the color. So when it comes to decorating for Christmas, I am at best a worker bee in the efforts of our home. I have no idea what goes where, and I have n no idea what looks good where, but I do generally take direction well. But I have to tell you, for the longest time, I absolutely hated decorating for Christmas. The hassle of putting up lights, carrying our tree upstairs, fluffing out all the branches, making sure that each one of the ornaments has one of those little metal hooks on it so that it can properly go on the tree, and then put it, taking the time to make sure that it all looks really nice and pretty. I hated it. <laughs> getting that tree put up and then having to worry all month about chasing the cats out of the tree when they would decide to climb it, or making sure that certain ornaments were put up high enough so that the children, when they were small, didn't go and grab the ornaments to play with and break them. And I have to admit that when it came to decorating for Christmas, I was most definitely a Scrooge. But a few years ago, my outlook on decorating for Christmas changed. And really, my outlook on Christmas in general changed as well. You see, my children began to grow, and I could see how happy it makes them to be a part of the decorating. But not only that, it was pointed out to me that we're not just decorating because it's that time of year to decorate. We're decorating our homes because we're celebrating the birth of our Savior Jesus Christ. And what a change in thought for me. I've gone from, oh, I hate doing this, to I don't mind doing this. <laughs> because it's more than just shiny decorations that we're putting up. See, the things that we do to prepare for Christmas have meaning. Some of them have great and deep meaning to us. For our family, when we put up our tree now, we look at all the ornaments that we've collected throughout the years, and we tell the stories of them. We look at how our family has grown over the past 13 years. We talk about the ornaments that have belonged to people in our families that have passed away, and we remember them and tell their stories. This has become something wonderful that I actually look forward to each year. See, we tend to have these problems of wondering why should we be decorating anything in this world today? We look at the drabness of this time of year, and I will tell you that um, the fact that it's dark at like, I don't know, 2.30 in the afternoon right now <laughs> drives me crazy every single year. But we look at that and we think about that and we focus on all the hardships that we've been through and we dwell on, dwell on the fact that the priorities of this world have gone so far astray from what we feel they should be 
that it's easy for us to say, what is the point of even trying to decorate? Well, let us hear again the words from Isaiah 61, starting in verse 3. To provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. So why would God give to the people these things in Isaiah? Why would he give them these things to decorate in the middle of them calling out for their return to home? What is the point? Well, the point for them and the point for us is this. We might be experiencing a tough time, but we choose to do the things that make this world better and make this world more beautiful. When we decorate our homes and our churches, we're not saying that we're unaware of the difficulties in this world. We're not saying that we're oblivious to the bad news that's all around us. But what we are saying is that we choose to live by the good news. We're saying we choose to live by hope and not despair. We are not simply people that are looking at this world through rose-colored lenses. We're doing what we are told by the prophets. We're fulfilling our call to act in hope. So let's think about Isaiah's words. The Lord brings the good news. The Lord, through the prophet, proclaims the year of the Lord's favor. We must consider that we are called to do the same thing as Isaiah. We are the ones that are to bind up hearts. We are the ones to set people free. We are the ones who rebuild. We work because we believe. We build because we hope. We are blessed. In our second reading, we find how hope, we find hope as well. You see, John wants us to hope. Both Johns do, actually. John, the gospel writer, and John the Baptist. But John knows that the only way to do that is to look beyond. See, John the Baptist is introduced in the gospel as seemingly the first human to be a part of this story. But he is presented in a way to point beyond himself to the one who is coming. In John 1, 6 through 8, the ma- there was a man from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. These verses seem so out of character from the ones that are around them, if you read through, that a lot of scholars actually think that maybe this is misplaced. But on the other hand, they might be there for the exact precise reason to serve the point that beyond this named person, beyond this John the Baptist, is something greater, something brighter. See, we know John was not the like, not the light, just like you are not the light, I am not the light. Well, I'm just a light. That's a big difference than being the light. We are not, we are not the light. But what we are. We are the people that light the lights so that the true light can be seen. John continues to point beyond himself in the verse, John 119. This is the testimony of John when the Jews sent to him priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? And he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. I am not the Messiah. It seems like a simple and obvious statement. Yet how often do we need to repeat this phrase for ourselves? I am not the Messiah. And it is a good phrase for us to keep in mind. It's easy for us to make the mistake of trying to take that on for ourselves at times. See, we must remember that though we are to do good works for the Messiah and in his name, it is not we that are the ones that are doing the saving. Salvation is not ours to give or to withhold from someone. We constantly find ourselves in a situation where we can claim that good works we do for ourselves, and I caution you to be mindful to not make that mistake. We have to remember that just like John, we are not the one that is coming, 
We are the ones that are preparing the way for him to come. We are the ones that are to be getting people ready for Jesus' return. See, we are the ones that should be decking the halls. Isaiah does it with garland and with oil. John did it with water. And we do it with decorations. I'm just kidding. That is only part of what we are to. It's just one thing. What we do is we do it by sharing the love of Jesus with all that we meet. We do it by brightening the light in others. And we do it through acts of service in the name of Jesus Christ. Asking nothing more that, than that the name of Christ be glorified through our service. See, we are preparing our space. We're preparing our hearts and we're preparing this world for the one who comes. Our preparation for company is a proclamation and an invitation. We practice for receiving the Savior by receiving those that the Savior has saved. We don't practice for the return of Christ by excluding others. We practice for the return of Christ by bringing, bringing others in to wait with us. And we acknowledge them as part of that company that we have been waiting for. Can you imagine the joy that you would have by bringing that long-lost prodigal person in your life back into the church? Can you imagine the joy of bringing that friend or family member that you have worked on for so long into being part of the family of God? Think of the joy that these things would bring to us and then multiply it by a thousand. And then that is the joy that it would bring Christ. And so, brothers and sisters, as you decorate for this season, remember that we are decorating for the return of the Lord. We do this by best by decorating our hearts with his love and by helping others to learn and prepare themselves for that company that is coming as well. And so my challenge for you this week is to consider the meaning behind the things that you use to decorate your home and, and the church. Don't just let them be something that's beautiful to look at. Think about how they honor and prepare you for the company of God. Amen.